Major funding for In Your Neighborhood Innovation has been provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working with others to build a national culture of health, enabling everyone in America to live longer, healthier lives. Since the dawn of America's industrial age, when Alexander Hamilton helped harness hydropower at Patterson's Great Falls, New Jersey genius has transformed the way the world lives and works, connects and communicates, and comprehends our place in the universe. Creating an innovation economy to build what's next? We got this. Hello, I'm Mary Alice Williams, standing outside the famous Black Mariah, widely known as America's first movie studio that used the sun to light the screen to launch an industry. For the next half hour, we'll walk you through just a few of New Jersey firsts invented or innovated here. Because this state had the space for factories, the workforce to power them, the transportation lines to move products to markets in major cities and financial centers, and the will to make it all work. Still does. If there's one inventor who personifies Jersey genius, it's the man who invented this and a thousand more practical, once unimaginable innovations. Brianna Venosi starts us off at a 19th century incubator in Menlo Park. Almost everyone knows him as a genius. If you ask Thomas Edison, he'd say he had stick to -itiveness. Either way, his legacy permeates New Jersey's rich history. Edison sets up this place like no other place in the world had been done. It was here at the aptly named Invention Factory, built in Menlo Park, that Edison and his teams of brilliant scientists, known as the Muckers, would work around the clock, creating and improving other inventions, like Bell's telegraph and telephone. From that research, Edison hears something. He writes down a little drawing, and uh, he creates what we know today as the phonograph. He has 1,093 patents in the U.S and 1,250 patents in 34 other countries. Edison and the Muckers would perfect the incandescent light bulb, and no, they never laid claim to inventing the original, eventually bringing his direct current, or DC, electric power generation and distribution to the world. That success spurred greater contributions from competitors, from the invention factory to the idea factory of Bell Labs. The team hired to make Bell's telegraph and telephone company, we know it today, as AT&T would later move to Murray Hill, New Jersey, the laboratories still going strong as Nokia Bell Labs. They were encouraged to have serendipitous encounters, to cross-pollinate, to learn from each other. No deadlines, no budget constraints, just study, learn, create. It was the birthplace for the transistor, revolutionizing the electronics industry to solid state, earning a Nobel Prize. Nearly a dozen sites would be built throughout the state to support the Bell Labs work. The first solar cell, radar technology, mobile phone communications. Scientists changed radio astronomy as we knew it. We set out at a frequency where we didn't expect there to be much at the Milky Way, tried to make a measurement and see if we could measure zero. And lo and behold, we didn't measure zero. We discovered the cosmic microwave background. AKA leftover radiation, providing evidence to the Big Bang Theory. Much like the innovators before them, the science was about doing good for the many. Lasers and fiber optics, transoceanic telephone cables, thousands of inventions came from these labs. At the same time, a man named David Sarnoff was on the scene, recognizing the potential of radio as a point-to-mass broadcasting system. He became the president of RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, in the early 1920s. He oversaw the development of communication technologies that came to define the information age. He had ideas of how the future would look like, or how he wanted the future to look like, and he hired a bunch of smart people to make that happen. Under his leadership, RCA organized the first radio broadcasting network, and that sparked Sarnoff's ideas for television. His RCA engineers would perfect the black and white picture and invent color TV. Every year on his birthday, he would go to 
the uh, RCA labs and ask his engineers for something. Uh, one year it was a TV so flat it could hang on the wall like a picture frame. It was that forward thinking that brought much of the consumer electronics we associate with RCA today. Inventing SEMO, semiconductor technology, the electron microscope, perfecting lasers, digital memory, broadcast camera equipment, the first liquid crystal displays or LCD screens. At his RCA labs in Princeton, now SRI International, it's also where my father, Fred Venozzi, has spent nearly 40 years as an electrical engineer, part of that living history. One of the things that maybe really uh, helped people, especially people with, with some physical disabilities, uh, keeping them stuck in a, a chair, was the development of the full function remote control. Today, much of the focus has shifted to artificial intelligence and augmented reality. One of the applications is autonomous vehicles, uh, where uh, we are using uh, cameras to be able to know exactly where the car is. And we wonder what Edison would think. Thomas Edison worked here in West Orange at this very desk, and the spirit of ingenuity embedded here has been adopted by generations of biomedical researchers throughout the state. In 1944, Rutgers professor Silman Waxman co-discovered Streptomyces griseus, just named the official state microbe. Streptomycin was the first antibiotic effective against tuberculosis, whooping cough, and forms of meningitis, for which he won the Nobel Prize. In this decade, 2013, Immunotherapies invented here have revolutionized cancer treatment, and New Jersey pharmaceuticals are building on that work to design ever more effective drugs. Here's Rhonda Schaffler. In the field of science, innovation does not come quickly. It occurs slowly, one test tube at a time. But a breakthrough can change everything. In cancer treatment, that breakthrough was a new approach to immunotherapy, a type of treatment that uses a patient's own immune system to fight the disease. For a long time, doctors have wondered why the immune system is broken when it comes to cancer because normally if you have a foreign cell invading your body, your immune system will attack it. So everybody thought, oh, cancer patients have bad immune systems and we need to stimulate the immune system. And none of that actually worked. But then an innovation happened in New Jersey that changed cancer treatment, research, and the lives of people like Jim Gritsky, a former Newark City firefighter diagnosed with stage four kidney cancer in 2017. When you first are diagnosed, you're like kind of a little floored. You don't know what's gonna happen and, and how, how you're gonna proceed. Fortunately for Gritsky, while he was fighting fires in Newark many years ago, researchers at the small Princeton-based biotech firm Metarex were conducting trials on a human antibody which they believed could help the body's immune system unlock its ability to effectively fight cancer. I happened to be at Yale at the time where we were doing studies with the drug um, that became nivolumab before BMS actually acquired it. Um, from the company called Metarex. And we started seeing that this drug worked amazingly for people with melanoma and also for lung cancer. Opdivo and Your Voice, sold by BMS or Bristol Myers Squibb, were the products of Metarex's work. They were followed by Merck's Keytruda. These drugs are known as checkpoint inhibitors, a new type of cancer immunotherapy which Science Magazine called a turning point in cancer. Dr. Howard Hoxter says the new drugs revolutionized the treatment approach. It's taken away a lot of the less effective and more toxic treatments and replaced it with a pretty simple antibody treatment um, that has very few side effects. 
There are more than 850 immunotherapy clinical trials currently underway across the country, and New Jersey is leading the way in oncology research. In fact, 58% uh, of all clinical trials in New Jersey are in oncology versus 41% across the country. At the Rutgers Cancer Institute, researchers here are conducting clinical trials. I think that we're getting closer to understanding biomarkers that can predict which patients will respond to immunotherapy. Because um, the holy grail is if a patient walks into the office, we'll be able to run assessments that would tell us up front who will respond specifically to which type of therapy. After surgery and radiation, Gritsky began a clinical trial at the Rutgers Cancer Institute, receiving immunotherapy infusions for his cancer. His treatment ended this past March. Uh, for me, I was lucky. I did, really didn't have any adverse reactions from the whole treatment phase. And uh, I think that's one of the, the things that hopefully this immunotherapy will be able to help patients with so they can lead a normal life and go on with the things they like to do. For Gritsky, that means walking his dog Lexi, planning a summer vacation, and looking forward to celebrating his 45th wedding anniversary this fall. While Gritsky benefited from immunotherapy, not every patient responds to it. But there's reason for optimism. The FDA continues to approve using checkpoint inhibitor drugs for a broader range of cancer. Doctors believe these drugs are an important step toward the goal of curing cancer. And if one day that does happen, it will be thanks in part to the research and discoveries made right here in New Jersey. Around the time a teenage Thomas Edison was starting to tinker with telegraph apparatus, Rutgers University in 1864 had been designated the State College for the Benefit of Agriculture and the Mechanic Arts. In 1880, the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station was formed on campus. It's where the modern greenhouse was invented in the 1960s, and they've pushed the boundaries of botany, horticulture, and agriculture ever since. Brenda Flanagan found out what's new. If plants could play their personal music, the Carolina Reaper's a hot and heavy metal lick. Such a botanical explosion, says Rutgers professor Albert Ayeni. You need to keep milk and ice cream on standby. An atomic bomb. <laughs> <laughs> the baby pepper plants in Ayeni's greenhouse here at the Rutgers, New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station pose no danger. But come harvest time, students who pick the ripe reapers must wear gloves. Ayeni, his nickname is Dr. Pepper, explains that on the Scoville heat scale, which runs from zero to two million, the reaper scores two million. The Carolina reaper, uh, as of today, is known to be the hottest pepper in the United States. Despite its Carolina name, Ayeni found the reaper grows great in Jersey, and it's only one of dozens in his exotic pepper project arsenal. Far more palatable and a bestseller among pepper fans is this Rutgers innovation, the pumpkin habanero, which hits a golden 30 to 40,000 on the heat scale, much closer to Jersey's comfort zone. It's got a mellower musical bite, kind of like... Are you saying Jersey is wimpy? <laughs> We can't take no, any. No, no. We know that a lot of our clientele cannot take much heat. Ayani helped crossbreed the pumpkin habanero. It took six years. The Nigerian immigrant came to Rutgers in 1995 and saw a need to spice up Jersey's pepper varieties to serve the state's growing ethnically diverse population who like some heat in their kitchen. There is so much demand for all these ethnic crops. And uh, when we got together, we put a proposal together to USDA that is an area where there is significant need. There are ethnic, the ethnic population is rising so high and we have a responsibility 
as a land-grant college to respond to this diversity. The Feds established Rutgers as a land-grant college back in 1862, and they've been innovating crop improvements ever since, like the Rutgers Scarlet Night Strawberry, intense flavor, and hazelnut trees that don't die in New Jersey. They did. And a double-layer plastic greenhouse that's gone global. It's one of the cheapest, most effective ways to grow a crop under glass, as we would say, or in this case, under poly. But the most famous Rutgers creation? That jingle for Camden-based Campbell's Soup describes its signature ingredient, the Rutgers tomato, crossbred at Rutgers in 1934. The hand-picked Rutgers ruled for decades until tomatoes that could be mechanically harvested made the Rutgers obsolete. It disappeared, but gardeners wanted their Jersey tomato back. Jersey growers could never, could not get access to these seeds, but they had all these uh, memories uh, that came, in some cases, through their families about you know, these varieties that were very specific to their, their needs. Rutgers Extension Specialist Tom Orton helped recover the Rutgers with seeds Campbell's had kept from its original parents. They crossbred them with varieties boasting better disease resistance and set up taste tests, searching for that original mm -mm goodness. We also selected the populations intensely for flavor. We redeveloped using the same source of germplasm in the same way with a few uh, modern uh, additions. The result, the Rutgers 250, a hybrid named in honor of the university's semi-quincentennial in 2016. And Jersey tomatoes are still favorites at Rutgers plant sales. So we have the Rutgers, which is the classic, and then the Rutgers 250, which is a hybrid developed a couple of years ago. And those always sell out rapidly. Several more new crop varieties are expected next year from folks who are all, pardon the pun, outstanding in their fields. In New Brunswick, I'm Brenda Flanagan. This machine shop grounds the compound where the Wizard of Menlo Park moved his operation in 1887. He built it on a revolutionary idea that researchers working in teams to take an idea from invention to distribution in one place beat single scientists working alone. Roughly half of Edison's record 1,093 patents were based on experiments conducted here, 389 of them for advances in electric light and power. Generations of Jersey's best brains have built on that legacy. Soon vast tracts of ocean will hold turbines to harness the wind. And with nearly 100,000 solar arrays already installed, it's among the states leading the nation in capturing the sun. But storing excess power to hold in reserve in case of emergency, that's the next challenge. Joanna Gag has found towns that are taking it on. It's a resource whose potential has only just been tapped. But how do we harness its energy to power New Jersey into the future? Take this solar storage system in West Caldwell that's attached to a waste treatment facility. The solar facility is providing power to the grid just like it would any other day. The grid is the electrical system that delivers energy to consumers. This solar storage system was built by PSENG, an underwriter of NJTV. During the day, it powers homes in the area, but can help fill the energy gaps when the power goes down. In the event of a power outage, the solar facility will disconnect from the grid and then po provide power to the waste treatment facility and prolong it to operate for an additional week to two weeks. This is one of 12 microgrids the Board of Public Utilities is building through a pilot program studying solar storage. When the grid is out, the microgrid can run and that's the uniqueness of it. Highland Park is next in line for a solar grid. Gail brill mittler is the mayor here. Well, Highland Park prides itself on being what we call New Jersey's first green community. Our green initiatives actually started almost two decades ago when we built our buildings and put the solar panels up there. We are committed to a greener 
state and community. How does innovation play a role in all of this? How do we innovate? How do we find new ways to solve old problems? That's a really good question. Um, we need to think about the future. We need to harness all of the wonderful energy that this world, this earth, gives to us without creating more smog, um, greenhouse gases. The microgrid in Highland Park is different from the others in two ways. First, this used to be a landfill that sat as unused space for decades. Second, in the event of a storm, the energy that's stored here will only go to the critical services right here in the town, things like the police and fire station. We're actually turning this previously unusable piece of land into a major research project for solar energy that will benefit not only Highland Park, but the entire state of New Jersey. You're gonna see energy storage, I believe, as a major component and a major initiative as we go forward. Has that been one of the greater challenges of renewable energy? It, it has. And it's a question the state needs to answer in order to reach Governor Murphy's goal of 100% clean energy by 2050. That's where these batteries come in. They can store solar to fill the gaps when sunlight dips. It's sunny out right now. Clouds could come over in a second and the, 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 the solar energy reduces. So there can be rapid changes in the amount of energy that a solar facility generates. With the battery, they're able to discharge and consume energy quickly so that you don't have a rapid change of very little power to a lot of power. Fiordaliso says it's exciting, but also necessary. We have a problem. It's not only a New Jersey problem, it's an Earth problem. But we happen to be a coastal state. And if the sea levels continue to rise, ultimately, there may not be an Atlantic City. I hope that other municipalities in the state of New Jersey start thinking about how we can make this world a better place for everyone. We must address these issues right now. If we want to leave a world for our children and our children's children and future generations, we must not be the problem. We must be the solution. A solution, she says, that'll require the collective effort of everyone. In Highland Park, Joanna Gagas. scratch the surface. This record hall is the receptacle for a trove of scientific treasure. The complex holds some 400,000 artifacts from Edison's era, 5 million documents, 48,000 sound recordings, 10,000 rare books, 3,000 lab notebooks, and 60,000 photographs. And chances are the geniuses working on what's next will be able to trace the origins of their innovations right back here. Thank you to the National Park Service members who maintain the Thomas Edison National Historical Park. I'm Mary Alice Williams. Thank you for being with us. Well, innovation is many things, I guess. Innovation means changing the world to make it a better place. Making things that we need work better. It means getting outside of your regular thinking mode. Innovation is finding solutions to problems. Innovation is imagination. Thinking about a future that holds no limits. Solving problems with new technology and new information and new ways of doing business. Bring therapies and cures to the patients who need them when they need them. Creating change hopefully improves the way they live their life. Innovation is extremely broad, extremely useful, and essentially universal trait. A new idea, it's an improvement on idea. Taking things from the past and with things from the future and molding them together into something that's 
more useful than, than what exists today. Just making our life easier, and really that's what Thomas Edison was all about. He made everyday life better, and uh, so I think that's what innovation is. Thomas Edison was an innovator. He wasn't solving the problem necessarily, but he did provide some light. In the future now, there's going to be ways and new things to help people, uh, to help people save their lives. Who knows what innovation is going to be in the next 20, 30 years? We've already come so far. And we have a lot of brain power in New Jersey. And a lot of brain power that is going to help us move forward. There are sparks of ideas that lead to big changes. We have to think of how can we do more with less. We have to be innovative. I don't think it's, it's uh, relegated to just an inventor. Any one of us can be an innovator. Major funding for In Your Neighborhood Innovation has been provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working with others to build a national culture of health, enabling everyone in America to live longer, healthier lives.